Hello, I'm Stan. I'm a forensic specialist. I do crash investigations and I analyze car crashes and stuff. And then I go to court and testify to how crashes happen, why crashes happen, etc. So I'm essentially a court expert in the scientific environment. Now, for starters, I'm not an epidemiologist, a virologist, a statistician or anything like that. So I'm not going to make any claims about any kind of special experience, knowledge or anything. Um, and uh, I'm also stranded in Florida from South Africa, waiting to return to South Africa when it's safe, possible and reasonable and realistic to do so. That being said, I want to talk about COVID-19 as well. Now, a lot of people have had a lot to say about COVID-19. And just to give you an idea of the environment I'm in, in Florida right now at the moment, as I'm filming this, which is on whatever the date is today, 12th of May, whatever it is, 2020, um, there are 41,923 cases and 1,799 deaths. So it's quite a serious environment. It's certainly um, an environment to be, to be alert and aware of the issue of COVID-19. Now, I've seen a lot of people rant and rave about COVID-19 and everybody had an opinion. And, you know, there's a lot of videos doing their own. Some videos are getting removed and others are specifically being added and people are bashing other people and everybody has a thought about it. So I decided, well, if everybody's doing videos and they all have opinions, then maybe the time has come for me to share mine. Now, some people say it's a hoax. They think there is no COVID-19 and other people think uh, it's the end of the world and they blame things like 5G and Illuminati and whatever. Uh, that's interesting. Um, but I have questions, though. So in, in my case, I'm not going to be giving opinions as much as I'm going to be giving asking questions. And I'm hoping that by asking the right questions, I can potentially get the right answers. So this is not a video about 5G. If you're looking for 5G, look somewhere else. Uh, let's talk about this video and what I'm trying to get across. Now, I want to confirm for starters that I think there is a virus. I'm not a denialist. OK, I also think that people are getting sick or viruses that infect people can invariably have certain effects on their physiology and that means they can get ill from it. Equally, I think some people are dying as a result of the effects and influences of viruses on their body. I don't deny any of that. So don't say that, uh, uh, or rather, before everybody jumps up and starts saying things like, why don't you believe it? Don't you believe that people are dying? I do. People are dying. People are getting sick. There is a virus. So let's get that out of the way. But I want to talk about the actual virus a little bit and then uh, get to some of these questions I may have because I have questions and I'm hoping that somebody's going to come along with rational, intelligent, well formulated, um, perhaps scientifically sound answers to my questions. So in this video, I'm going to ask questions and I invite you and everybody else to please come and give some answers if you can. But don't argue because arguing it changes nothing. Um, let, let's look at that. Let's just stay to that. I'm going to ask some questions and I'm hoping somebody can give me reasonable answers. Now, here's the first question I've got. The question I've got is, are COVID-19 symptoms totally unique? Is there a set of symptoms that is specifically isolated only to COVID-19? Now, if you take, for instance, something like hearing loss, uh, it can only be hearing loss. You can't have somebody go blind and say, I think it's like hearing loss. Therefore, call it kind of hearing loss. So my question is, when we talk about COVID-19, is there, are there symptoms that are specifically unique only to COVID-19? Uh, for that, we can refer to some specialists and some clever people to tell us what that is. And, and this is what this video is about. What are the most common symptoms of COVID? Fever, cough, shortness of breath. It's also common to have body aches. But COVID-19 is sometimes more than just a respiratory disease, or sometimes not a respiratory disease at all. It can mimic just about any illness. Sometimes it looks like a common cold. Sometimes it looks like influenza. As far as the symptoms are concerned, we've discussed it. Now my question is, how exactly is screening done? What exactly makes somebody positive or negative? How do we decide whether somebody is COVID-19 positive or how do we decide that they are negative? Is that something that can be answered simply? Now, if you compare this or if you try to compare this to the common flu, and many people have done it, they've said, oh, but it's worse than the flu or better than the flu. And in the case of flu, well, I don't think you can, personally, I don't think you can compare the two because what worries me about that is flu has never, ever been monitored this closely. Secondly, there's not only one type of flu. As we know, there are different types of influenza or upper uh, respiratory system diseases. So you cannot take an estimate of what we think from one side and a and and a, and a, and a, all a near uh, um, 
obsessive analysis of another disease and then try to compare the two directly. So I don't think an, an, a comparison can be done. And if anybody has a realistic comparison, perhaps you can share that. But I don't believe that they were ever monitored or shared in the same way. So I don't know that we can compare the two. Now, as far as the diseases are that have similar symptoms, if there are similar symptoms, let's just look at those. What about things like the common cold? What about the various strains of flu? Now we're talking about influenza, we're talking about MERS, we're talking about SARS and all the H1N1. There are all these different ones. Then there's bronchitis, there's pneumonia, there's asthma, there's uh, COPD. How do, how do the symptoms compare? How do you isolate the two? If somebody has a set of symptoms, how do we know which one of all those ones they specifically have. Uh, and that's a question that I have and I'm hoping somebody can answer as well. And when you've analyzed somebody, now I'm talking here not about a, a microscopic analysis of an actual virus, having a photograph of a virus and deciding what it is. I'm talking about the way that testing is done in the broad sense. How do we isolate those other diseases specifically from COVID-19 at this stage? And more importantly, what is the percentage of each of them? Are we talking 90% of cases is COVID-19, 2% is, is cold, 1% is influenza, some is MERS, H1N1, whatever. So my question is, how do we isolate those to be sure that the symptoms we are looking at are specifically indicated for COVID-19 and not one of the others? Now, in and all this, there's been a lot of talk about people dying. So I want to discuss the issue of what is called, now, oh, just by the way, Everything I'm quoting or referring to is stuff that I found on the internet, on things like the CDC website, etc. So I tried to find the best possible sources for any uh, terms and references I make. This is not all my own knowledge. I'm trying to stay within, let's at least call it mainstream science, as far as I am able to. So I'm not claiming that this is knowledge that I have as a medical professional, but uh, I found something interesting. This is called the so-called morbidity rate or the rate at which people are dying, specifically uh, in, in reference to these numbers we see, so many infections, so many recoveries, and so many deaths. Now, the question is, you get two, in, in my opinion, you get two types of morbidity as far as I'm able to determine. The one is total morbidity. With other words, how many people or what percentage of people considering the whole population will die of a particular disease. And then there's a thing called case morbidity, or how many people with the disease, what percentage of them will actually die from it. Now, if you uh, take 100 people of a population, I'm going to just uh, give you a quick demonstration. You have 100 people, right? If 10 people get sick, you have a 10% infection rate. So 10% of the people are infected with that particular disease, whatever that might be. Now, of the 10 people, if one person dies, you have a 10% case morbidity, but you only have a 1% total morbidity. With other words, you must be careful not to mix the two. How many people die from having the disease is not the same as how many people die from potentially having the disease. So we must be careful not to mix that number. So keep that in mind because I'm going to refer back to that. Now, Let's go to an area or place that really gives us a good example of how bad things can get. Let's talk about New York. Now, in New York, as I was doing this video again, there was 184,319 confirmed cases. There were 15,101 deaths. But then there were also so-called 5,136 probable deaths. Now, I don't know what the difference is between the two, but for the purpose of this exercise, I'll just add them together and say that any death that's put on the number is related to this, specifically to COVID-19, for the purpose of illustration at least. Now, there are about 18,804,000 people in New York, according to the statistics I could find. That means that the case morbidity rate, with other words, the number of people that are dying from the disease that are sick compared to others that are sick is 11%. However, the actual total morbidity rate or the number of the or the percentage of the total population of New York City, now I'm talking New York City, is 0.1%. So it's a 0.1% total morbidity. So don't be confused between how many people die from the disease and how many people die in the area from being in the same place where the disease exists. Back to my example. Now, then we go further, and, and the risk of people between the age of 0 and 65, with other words, everybody up to the age of 65, what percentage of people in New York died of COVID-19, or at least whose deaths were linked to COVID-19? Now, that's only 
27%. That's a total of 5,463 deaths. If we look at that, which essentially represents the greatest part of the population as far as uh, active people are concerned. Let's say everybody over 65 potentially have underlying immune system deficiencies or perhaps they're starting to develop age, you know, linked diseases and cancers and diabetes and everything. For the people under 65, we are talking about a 2.9% morbidity rate, case morbidity rate. But here's the thing, only a 0.03% total morbidity rate. So when we hear the people speak on television telling us how dangerous a disease is, they are speaking to everybody. But you need to consider also not only how dangerous a disease is, but also where in the scale of risk you fall. Because we know that people over a certain disease on the 27%, there's at least close to a 30%, in fact, 33% risk, 66% uh, risk going higher, or actually more than that, going higher uh, as you get older. So that I'm not saying it's okay for old people to die. Don't get me wrong. I'm just trying to get to the questions I have about all this and I'm trying to lay the foundation. So bear with me here. Now, my question is, while we are busy studying and analyzing and closely following specifically COVID-19, what about at the same time, looking for things like flu, bronchitis, COPD, emphysema, pneumonia, uh, H1N1, SARS, MERS. Why are we not studying all those things at the same time? And we are looking at people. Why is nobody telling us that of the people with, with flu-like symptoms, which is a term you hear a lot, and who have impaired upper respiratory issues, of those people, X percentage have been identified as probably COVID-19, a percentage cold and flu and bronchitis and pneumonia and whatever. Where are those numbers? Why are they missing? Um, I'm worried about that. Now, let's get on to the issue of testing because I'm a little bit worried about the testing issue. In South Africa, there were some figures quoted for how many tests have been done. At the same time, the South African president, President Ramaphosa, went on television and mentioned a much lower number. I think he said something around the 15,000 mark. From the more than 126,000 tests conducted, 3,465 confirmed cases of coronavirus have been identified. More than 10, 2 million people have been screened in communities across the country. And of these, over 15,000 have been referred for proper testing. So which is which? What is a test and what is meant by a test? So I believe there are three kinds of tests. The first one we have is so-called screening. That's where people are exposed uh, to a medical professional. They ask some questions, I, I assume. Uh, how do you feel? Have you coughed? Have you been exposed to anybody? Have you traveled? Whatever. And based on that screen test, you can be declared at risk. Now, my question is, when are you added to the COVID-19 numbers? What are the conditions under which, based on a conversation, or the symptoms you might have, are you positively assigned a COVID-19 status? Now, that's the question I've got. The next one that we have is the so-called swab testing. That's where they stick the crap in your nose and your mouth, and then they do a screen on that. Now, when those are done, how accurate uh, is that measured, and what is measured, and how are those results assigned? Um, my question is, does somebody who has a positive result from a swab test, can they be declared to have COVID-19? What if they had other diseases, uh, MERS, H1N1 or whatever? How do we, again, separate those? Is the test designed and capable of dividing between specifically COVID-19 and something else? Funny, I've never heard a single article or seen a single video where they actually indicate that there is a test that looks specifically, only and exclusively for COVID-19 that can have no negative or positive false results that are specifically designed for this virus right now. So I'm not aware of that. So help me if there is, please. Now, um, how reliable are these swab tests, as an example? If we look at the following video. Sample za mbuzi, tukachukua sample za kondo, tukachukua sample za papai, tukachukua pa sample za oili ya gari, tulipopereka sample ya papai. Tukaipa jina Elizabeth Anne, miaka 26, female. Papai lile lilikuwa positive.
kwamba lina corona maana yake maji mle ndani zilizotolewa mle kwenye papai ni positive now that was the president of Tanzania and he specifically stated that they sent in swabs from things like pawpaws and engine oil and goats and whatever and those results came back with res- I mean, for things positive for things that don't exist and negative for things that are irrational so as far as i'm concerned my question is how much value can we place in the swab test if these are the kinds of results coming out of course it's possible that there's a problem with the testing and we'll get to that but what happens if somebody had any kind of covid infection before as i've asked before what happens if there's a history now that's the question so what about these antibody tests this is where they i think they might take blood or whatever they check for antibodies my question is how are those tests done how reliable are they uh, now what conditions are you declared positive and th- that's the thing we need to find out as well what makes somebody positive or negative and how reliable are those results there are at least some indications that i've come across that indicate that they are not 100% reliable anyway so how do we test remember this antibody test has to distinguish between coronavirus covid-19 the new coronavirus and all other coronaviruses or colds people have had. It also has to distinguish antibodies that can block the virus from getting in the cell, not just antibodies that recognize the virus. So scientifically, there's a hurdle here. And to date, I haven't seen published data that anybody has overcome that hurdle. What, what about asymptomatically positive people? People who test positive, but actually have no symptoms. What if... What if, and I've had several friends, personal friends tell me, but funny is that I was extremely ill this year or last year. My own wife, Jackie, got terribly ill some time ago. That's months ago. She got ill like three times in a row. How do we know that COVID-19 wasn't around before, that some of us didn't get it anyway, and that we have now built up an immunity? So if you come along and test us for the, for the, for the uh, for whatever they call it, the, the so-called uh, antibody test, how do we know you're not testing positive for a disease that existed before we bothered to start counting it so carefully? So that's my next question. What are these asymptomatic positive cases? And, and are they contagious? Well, those people that are asymptomatic but positive, can they actually infect other people? Uh, is there any information to that effect? I'd love to know that. What about bad testing? What about bad handling? What about bad storage? What about bad transport? What about poor samples? What about contamination? What about, you know, those kinds of things? How do they affect the results that we have? And how much do we decide that the results are so reliable that we should pray by them for lack of a different uh, term? So let's talk about this a little bit. I'm worried about the assignment of death specifically, and I've got questions about that too, because if somebody is in a hospital due to cancer and died and is tested positive later, did they die from COVID-19 or with it? Now, that's something that kind of worries me a little bit. So I've asked this question on Facebook and, and, and in other places several times. How do we isolate when somebody has multiple conditions of which they could pass away? Now, to give an example of how far that can go. In the Eastern Province Herald in that, that is published in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, an article came out where a patient died during heart surgery, which was surgery uh, performed on account of the condition the person suffered of as far as the heart is concerned, and they passed away, and they were made positive for COVID-19. Now, my question is, what does that really tell us? How many of the numbers we see can we trust to be fatalities caused by COVID-19 and how many are fatalities caused as a result of them. Now, what do we know and what do we do? This is what uh, we have on that. Well, last Friday, I received a seven page document that sort of told me that if I had an 86 year old patient that had pneumonia, but was never tested for COVID-19, but sometime after she came down with pneumonia, we learned that she had been exposed to her son who had no symptoms, but later on was identified with COVID-19, that it would be appropriate to diagnose on the death certificate COVID-19. Now, my next question is, if the disease is truly so deadly that we are comparing it to the Spanish flu, we'll get back to that, and all of these uh, exorbitant lockdown and all of these arrests and everybody, everything is designed purely to save lives because we know that COVID-19 kills. I've even seen an advert to that, COVID-19 kills, whatever. 
we know that to be the case. So my question is, if it's all to save lives and if it's so dangerous that we have to take these extreme measures, why is it that somebody that is tested positive for COVID-19 is told, um, you sick, please go home and just isolate yourself. No one isolates them individually. Nobody's concerned about people around them just dying in the string. They're sent home. Why is that the case? And even in New York, where we know that the problem is big compared to other areas and where it's overwhelming, even there, people are sent home and the majority of people that are contracting the disease are contracting it within the family unit, at least according to the news I could find. Overwhelmingly, the people were at home. Uh, where there's been a lot of speculation about this. A lot of people, again, had opinions. A lot of people have been uh, arguing uh, where they come from and where we should be focusing. But if you notice, 18% of the people came from nursing homes. Less than 1% came from jail or prison. 2% came from the homeless population. 2% from other congregate facilities. But 66% of the people were at home. But let's talk about Spanish flu a bit, because people, I've seen a lot of reference to Spanish flu. People have said, but they believe it's the same. They think it's the same. Uh, it's like Spanish flu. And if we don't do this, we don't do that. It could be. Uh, so let's talk about Spanish flu. Now, that happened back in 1819. And my question about Spanish flu again is, how was that positively diagnosed at the time? At the time, was the testing better than today? In other words, was there a way to say, you have Spanish flu? period. Nothing else. Can't be uh, MERS, can't be H1N1, can't be bronchitis, can't be pneumonia. It's definitely Spanish flu. So that's the first question I've got. How accurate was testing back then? Now, back in the day of Spanish flu, my question is, if you were diagnosed to be positive with Spanish flu, were you also told to just go home and to be with your family or to isolate on your own? Was that also the case? And I'd love to understand before we can compare the two, whether we had similar circumstances. And then what happened to other diseases during the time? During the period of Spanish flu, what were the fatalities and the hospitalization numbers for flu, for, for, for H1N1, for SARS, for MERS, for bronchitis, for pneumonia, for COPD? What, where are those numbers? I'd love to know. Or was it also a case of just everybody who has trouble breathing must be you know, suffering of Spanish flu? That's a question I'd love to see answered as well. And at that stage, did the government also order that you will record all deaths with the disease? Remember, there's a difference. The question is, can diseases be identified as a primary cause simply by their presence? With other words, I'm asking, if you have a variety of issues or you have a multitude of diseases, we call them comorbidities according to what I've learned, how do you isolate one as being the one to put on record? That's the question. Now, according to the CDC website, it states the following, it is estimated that about 500 million people or one third of the world's population became infected with the virus. Take note, estimated. So we know that it wasn't accurately monitored. The number of deaths was estimated to be at least 50 million world worldwide and about 675,000 occurred in the United States, about. But let's say for the second that it's accurate, it's 675,000. Now I look and I found that in 1980, according to information at my disposal, there was 103,208,000 people in the US. Now there were about 675,000 deaths. So what was the morbidity rate? Now for... For the Spanish flu, the morbidity rate was 0.6%. If you call not the case morbidity, right? The population morbidity rate. 0.6% of the people died. Compare that to New York right now during the peak of COVID-19. The case morbidity rate is higher, but the actual total morbidity rate in New York right now is only 0.1%. So we know, at least as far as we are able to check as we stand, that we must be careful about declaring that it's the same or similar at this early stage. And again, what happened to the upper respiratory other things? Where are they, right? Now, another thing I'd like to share is a common scientific um, understanding, and that is that correlation is not causation, exactly as this video clearly states. Welcome. I came here today to warn you about the dangers of ice cream. You may not be aware of this, but these innocent looking cones full of sweetness are one of the major causes of drownings. And I've got the numbers to prove it. 
So if you plot a graph of the number of ice creams that are sold, and you compare it with the number of drownings, you can see there is clearly an upwards trend. And I think it's very safe to conclude from this that we should ban ice cream, because it's very dangerous. <laughs> Since you are all smart people, you've probably figured out there's something wrong with my example. What's really happening here is, of course, that there is an underlying factor, which is nice weather, you might have guessed it. And if the weather is nice, more people will go out swimming and unfortunately drown, and at the same time, more people will buy ice cream. And it's not the ice cream that's causing the drownings. And here it's really easy to see that there is something wrong, but Jumping to an incorrect conclusion about causality when you see a correlation is the most often made logical mistake. Now, my question is, how can a death be identified as COVID-19 if other factors are not excluded? How do we say this number of people that died, died from the result of contracting COVID-19 and we can exclude everything else? I haven't been able to come across that answer then along came a thing everybody sent me a copy and a link to pandemic now i know what you're going to say she's a hoax it's about pushing the book and all that crap i'm going to ignore all that i don't care about the history i don't care about the book i don't have skin in the game i've not registered any patents i don't get any money from it as far as i'm concerned it's just interesting to me that in every single video I've seen in response to pandemic, there's been an attack on Dr. Judy uh, Mokovic. They've attacked her, the person. Uh, talk about her history, oh, and her paper was withdrawn or whatever. I'm not even going to discuss that. I'm just going to look at the things she says relating to COVID-19 in, in that issue. So a lot of people, uh, you, you, you share this or you see this, and the first thing is, oh, she's a pro-vaxxer. Uh, and that seems to be it. Now, that's classic military doctrine according to what i know if you want your soldiers to go along and kill the enemy the first thing you do is you dehumanize the enemy you give them funny names you give them funny names that are dehumanizing them so that they don't feel they're fighting an enemy then you do you basically create the narrative of how bad the enemy is and then soldiers are kind of justified to kill them because they're not humans and they are the enemy or whatever they might be called. At the very least, she's been called a pro axer That's an easy way to dehumanize her and to declare her something that should be stayed away from. But according to her, what, do we, what does she say? Is she a so-called pro axer Because she was asked about this and this is her answer. So I have to ask you, are you anti-vaccine? Oh, absolutely not. I'm, in fact... Vaccine is immune therapy, uh, just like interferon alpha is immune therapy. So I'm not anti-vaccine. My job is to develop immune therapies. That's what vaccines are. Now, people say a paper was withdrawn. I can't care about that. I'm not interested in the paper. They say she's pushing a book. So what? I agree. She is. There is a book. Right? It'll sell at one cell. I don't care. But what does she say that we can listen to? With other words, instead of shooting the messenger, how about we spend some time on the actual message? Now, she says that Dr. Fauci is spreading propaganda. Now, I have no way of measuring that. And that's the kind of stuff that I don't think we can say much about. And I'm going to stay away from that and only focus on the things that I think we can use as some kind of unit of measure in the environment that we find ourselves in. Now, she says that if the so-called Bidel Act is repealed, then... Uh, gone will be the days when government people can register patents. So my question is, can government people register patents? Is a patent, with other words, uh, can they, not a pattern, but a patent. So my question is, is that part true? Is it true that government employees can register patents on their own name? She says that Bill Gates has no medical qualifications, but he's, his voice is being heard in this whole issue of, of, of vaccinations and whatever. So my question is, is that true or does Bill Gates have qualifications that I'm not aware of? So that's the next thing we need to, to ask about. Is it true what she says? Is Bill Gates having an opinion, but he doesn't have medical qualifications or is he actually medically qualified and we don't know it? She says that people stand to make billions of dollars from vaccines. That's the next question. Is it true or is there some law or rule that I'm not aware about that declares that if you find a vaccine that is linked to say something like COVID-19 that you're not allowed to earn a cent? Or is it true that if you invent a cure for a disease, 
even if you're a government worker, that you can register a patent, patent and you get royalties or feedback or income or whatever it is from it. My question is, is that the truth? And if anybody can tell me, I'd appreciate that. She also says there is no vaccine for any RNA virus now that works. So firstly, I, I understand that COVID-19 is an RNA virus. The question is, is that the truth? Is there a vaccine that exists today that actually works for COVID-19 or is there not? And if there isn't, what is not true about that? That's what I have to ask. She's also not anti-vaccine. She says vaccine is an immune therapy. So here's the question. Is vaccine an immune therapy and is she uh, in support of that? According to her own words, as the video clearly states, she is. She says COVID-19 is not naturally occurring. She says uh, essentially that it's very clear that the virus was manipulated in a lab, but not necessarily created in the lab. In other words, she's saying that something was done to the virus. Now, my question is, while it might be true that we find no evidence, that's my personal question. While it might be true that we find no evidence that the DNA of the virus was manipulated, how do we know that the DNA of the host, perhaps this bat everybody talks about, was not manipulated or that there was no laboratory effort of any kind to influence the movements of this virus? That's the question I've got. Can anybody answer that? She says somebody didn't go uh, to a market and get a back bat and then get sick. So my question is, I've seen a video stating that there were no bats found at the uh, wet market in Wuhan. Was there? Wasn't there? Please, I'd love to know the answer to that. Was it in fact somebody who went and bought the bat and was it in fact that they got sick from the bat and this is suddenly out of the blue how it happened? Because uh, she says what happened is what is called an accelerated viral evolution. And if it's an accelerate, accelerated viral evolution, how could that happen? Because she says it would take 800 years. But in the case, it occurs from SARS-1 to COVID-19 within a decade. And apparently that's quite abnormal. If you have knowledge about that, please help me and help me understand how it is that suddenly we have a virus that can go from what is supposed to happen over 800 years and do it in, in uh, as little as a decade. So I'd like to know that. She said that in 1999, she was working at Fort Dietrich and that she, her job was to teach Ebola viruses how to get into humans. Now, her job was to teach it how to infect human cells without killing them. And she said that the Ebola virus at the time could not infect human cells until they took it into the lab and taught it how to. My question is, is that true? Is it true that that kind of research is done? Is there any evidence or proof that she wasn't involved in it? Or can you satisfy me that viruses cannot be taught to go from one species to another, although that does not happen naturally? That's what I'd like to know. Now, Dr. Deborah Burke said they took a very liberal approach to mortality. Here's the video where she says it. We've taken a, a very, very liberal, liberal approach. approach to mortality. Now, Dr. Mikovic says if her husband died and he, he actually has COPD and she says his lungs look exactly like they would in the case of COVID-19. So if he died and COPD is coincidentally a chronic lung disease that includes chronic bronchitis, bronchitis, emphysema, or perhaps even both. So she's asking whether her husband would have died of COVID-19. Now, again, we get back to, to Dr. Burks and she said if someone dies with COVID-19, we are counting that. And here's the video where she states that. If someone dies with COVID-19, we are counting that as a COVID-19 death. Now, here's what Dr. Mikovic says. You don't die with a virus. You die from it. Here she says it. You don't die with an infection. You die from an infection. Now my question is, is it true? that you can die with a virus versus from it. And is every COVID-19 case counted a death from COVID-19 or a case with COVID-19? That's what I need to understand. Now, she also goes on and she says that there's $13,000 for Medicare if you call any fatality or any disease at least COVID-19. Now, my question on that front is, is this true? Is it true that there's any funding linked to the positive identification of COVID-19? And is that funding at or near that figure? Is there any benefit financially when somebody is declared COVID-19 positive? Now, the following video adds something interesting. 
Right now, Medicare has determined that if you have a COVID-19 admission to the hospital, you'll get paid $13,000. If that COVID-19 patient goes on a ventilator, you get $39,000, three times as much. So my question is, is that true? Is it true that you get $13,000 for making somebody positive and then you get $39,000 if you put them on the ventilator? Because if that is the case, the question would be answered regarding whether hospitals benefit. Or be, I've heard the question of why would doctors do it? Why would doctors go and make people positive that are not? Well, $39,000 per patient could potentially be a good, a good reason unless you can satisfy me that that doesn't feature at all and I welcome you to do so. The outcome for a patient who has to be ventilated if they have COVID-19 is horrific. Chinese researchers studying critically ill patients on ventilators in Wuhan found in a group of 32, only one person survived. Another study from Wuhan suggests about 20% of patients on ventilators recover. So now my question on that is, is it true? Is a ventilator the wrong treatment or is a vent ventilator effective at curing or re helping a patient recover from COVID-19? The ventilators that are used as we see them being bought and sold all over the world, do, are they the best treatment option or are they not? Please feel free to help me understand that. Let's get to hydro, what's it, hydro, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, now, there's a doctor as well. If you look at the following video that states that uh, hydrochloroquine and zinc is a better option. We know that hydrochloroquine and zinc are working great for patients. So in that line, my question is, is it or is it not better? Is there any research to suggest that it isn't? And more importantly, Dr. Mikovic says that there are thousands of pages of studies to support this, to support the argument that hydrochloroquine and zinc is an effective treatment for COVID-19. Now, Dr. Fauci, on the other hand, says that that is only anecdotal evidence, and here he is saying it. In a survey polling nearly 2,300 doctors in some 30 countries, hydroxychloroquine was ranked as the most effective medication to treat the virus. Dr. Fauci calls that anecdotal data. It's not storytelling if we have thousands of pages of data saying it's effective against these families of viruses. So my question is, is uh, several thousand pages of research material and, 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 and many doctors saying it, is that false or is it not? Now, Dr. Uh, Mikovic also says that Italy has a very old population and they are very sick with, with, with inflammatory disorders. So my question is, is that accurate? Is that correct? is then older population in Italy. I've heard it said, but I'd like for people to know better to clarify or verify whether this is the case. And I'd love to know at this stage, what were the total fatalities in Italy in the months leading up to and going through COVID-19? Was there an increase in fatalities or was there an increase in COVID-19 fatalities or was there an increase in upper respiratory fatalities? And again, we get back to the various diseases. How do we determine that? Now, Dr. Mikovic also says that in 2019, the people in it Italy received an untested new form of vaccine. Now, the question is, is that true? Was there any vaccine being introduced in the early parts of 2019 in Italy? If that is true, she insists further that it consisted of four strains of influenza, one being H1N1. Again, the question is, is it true that that happened? And if that happened, can anybody clarify that? And if not, can anybody deny that? I'm not talking by argument. Please, folks, don't just argue with me and say uh, I'm being this way or that way. Just please bring me facts. Bring me some kind of reports or something. I'd like to understand this. That's my job every day. So that's the way I think. Now, she also says that flu vaccines increase the odds of somebody contracting COVID-19 by 36%. That's a big claim. That one I'm very interested to hear. If anybody can tell me uh, whether there's any study done anywhere to show the rate of contraction from, from, from COVID-19 comparing people who have had vaccines and people who have had no vaccines. If there's any such information, I'd appreciate it. She also says that wearing your mask activates your own virus as you breathe it in back uh, repeatedly. She's basically saying as you breathe in and out, your virus builds up in the mask and it exposes you. I've heard some people say you must and many say you, you shouldn't. So my question is, as far as scientific opinion is concerned, should you or shouldn't you? I'm not talking about somebody who's elderly, sick, uh, infected and identified as positive, trying to protect others. I'm talking about you yourself 
in isolation at home perhaps, or perhaps walking on your own on the beach, wearing this mask, and you are positive, can the virus in some way uh, increase because you are, according to what I understand, trapping it on your face, essentially. So here's the next thing she says. She says, why shut down beaches? She gives all these examples of things that are present in the water and in the environment that are supposed to be healthy. Can I get clarification on that? Is there anybody that confirm or deny that beaches, the sea and that environment and everything that happens there could be beneficial to people as far as health is concerned? So I'm trying to establish whether that was fake or not. Now, she also says that you don't get funded if you don't speak the party line. Here's the video where she says this. You don't get funded if you don't speak the party line. You don't get published. My question is, is that true or false? Can anybody tell me that there is a party line or not? And that if you do speak the party line, you do get funded, or if you don't, you don't. Is there any kind of information surrounding this? Are there any doctors out there perhaps that can clarify or confirm that they did a research or produced work that contradicts some kind of greater narrative and that resulted in them not getting funding? I'd like to know that. These are the things that concern me deeply and what are the answers to these questions? These are the questions I want. So how many cases of COVID-19 are there really? And I mean COVID-19. Not people with symptoms that are similar, not people um, who have died of heart attacks and they are just made positive, not people with COVID-19 or dying with COVID-19, people who are dying from COVID-19, not people who have upper respiratory disease type uh, symptoms, people who are actually COVID-19 positive. What are those numbers really? And my question is, out of those numbers, how many of those numbers are from other diseases, as I've mentioned, but simply branded as such? But what about uh, comorbidity? What about these multiple issues? Uh, how is that managed? Um, why are irrational decisions being made, like a surface not allowed to surf alone on the ocean on its own? A single person on their own is not allowed to walk along the beach, like in South Africa. E-commerce is not allowed. And that now the latest is you can only buy certain clothes. How does that make any sense? I mean, are we saying that there was any scientific discussion and that some medical professional epidemiologist or virologist came along and said that new clothing coming out of the factory, if it's Gucci or whatever the case might be, it carries the COVID-19 virus and can perpetuate the disease. But if you buy cheap Pepsi socks, that suddenly those socks will be fine. How do we get to this stage? How do we get to the point where we are starting to make decisions that, in my opinion, opinion make absolutely no sense. If anybody can give me scientific or at least a med medical reasons why one piece of clothing over another can be sold, please, I I'd love to hear the reasons for that. And last but not least, I have this as well. How many people have been hospital hospitalized for COVID-19 without any serious underlying diseases? So why? where's that number? I'd love to know how many people are in hospital right now who had COVID-19, who had no other diseases, no emphysema, no diabetes, no respiratory issues, no asthma, no, no cancer, no diabetes, no nothing, only COVID-19. Of that, how many people, where are the numbers for how many of those people actually end up in hospital? And then, of course, how many of those people have passed away where the only thing they found was an actual antibody test that the antibody says they were positive for COVID-19, that they had those symptoms only, no other comorbidities and passed away or got hospitalized from that. My question is also, where is the news about the struggle of the overloaded hospitals? I mean, in New York, for instance, they have the Javits Center, which is a conference center. I've been there. It's a massive place. Uh, I've stood in the conference center. I know how big it is. They've turned this into a field hospital to, to help with the overflow of other patients having to come there while the hospitals are overloaded. Where's the news on that happening? This was predicted, and it's still being predicted. We are trying to flatten the curve. We don't want our hospital system overloaded. We are worried about it. Take New York as an example. Can somebody please share some, some footage with me showing that that 
co- that uh, Javits Center is as busy as we predicted it will be. And more importantly, why do we see no footage from the overloaded hospitals? I've seen news articles right now declaring that some hospitals are actually having a problem because they're empty and nobody is coming there. I know somebody personally whose daughter is a, a, a health worker at a hospital and she's been placed on furlough. On furlough, don't come into work, we don't need you. Where are these people? Why is that happening? Now, some conspiracy theorists might argue that the reason why everybody's held at home is so that they can't go out and see that there's actually nobody at hospital. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to ask the question, please help me and convince me or show me that the concern, this great overload that we are so worried about, other than in Italy, I know it happened in Italy, I'm not denying Italy, just please help me see and understand how that is a problem in the areas like South Africa where this is what, he, what people are trying to avoid. Now it's gone so far that I think it was the Western Cape or wherever where they've stated that now every single patient that is tested COVID-19 positive must be at, uh, you know, placed in hospital. Uh, where did they get all these beds? They were worried about people getting so sick that they need hospital and they locking down the whole country to avoid it. But now suddenly there are all these beds where people who are simply tested positive, although everywhere else in the world, everybody's not going to hospital. Suddenly they are uh, arguing about those people going to hospital. That makes no sense to me. Please help me understand that. Uh, so, that, you know, these are the kinds of things that, that worry me a lot. Uh, all I'm looking for is answers. I'm just looking for somebody to help me understand it. And I think there are thousands, if not millions of people the world over who would prefer to simply understand what is going on. I'm not saying that I have any opinions. I'm not giving an opinion. I'm asking questions because I'm the kind of person that if you tell me I'm not allowed to walk at the beach and it makes no logical sense for me, I'd love to hear a sound scientific, medical or legal or a reason or argument that supports that. If you tell me I can buy um, running shoes, but I cannot buy court shoes, I'd love to understand how that that features in the virus. If you make threats like if people don't behave, we are going to go back to a lockdown. Where does the disease feature in that? How do we know? Oh, 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 my big concern is that we are potentially being deceived. And I want to be sure that I'm not being deceived. I just want to have the right information. If you can provide it, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you for watching. And I hope that at least you can take these questions further. And I'm hoping that I can get some realistic and reasonable answers to it. Thanks. Bye.